Welcome to another installment of uh, the Lawyers, Guns, and Money podcast. Like all of the other ones I've been involved in so far, this one will be about Game of Thrones. Um, not quite sure why that is. It's just sort of the way this is uh, rolling out. Um, eventually, we'll get to Mad Men, Breaking Bad, all sorts of other television as it comes on. Uh, our guest today is uh, Stephen At- Atwell. Uh did I pronounce that correctly? I... Uh, no one in the family going back like 700 years can agree. It's either Atwell, Atwell, Atwell. I've given up on trying to correct people, so... And I don't want to call cool. you Stephen A, because that just has too many terrible implications. Yeah. So, um, uh, we'll just go with Stephen? That's fine. All right. Um, and I, I think uh, we, I have a couple scenes that I want to discuss, um, some of which I already posted, but uh, uh, a bit of... Uh, but uh, I'm going to let you kind of run with the ball. And uh, season one, season three, episode one, um, go. Okay, so, I mean, you know, I thought people's responses was quite interesting in that they were expecting a huge bang. But if you look back to especially season two, episode one, these have to be set up episodes. There are so many storylines, so many plots, where you have to tee up what's going on to all the stories we were already following and then, you know, introduce all of the, like, umpteen billion new characters. But I thought it did a, a, a good a good job of kind of melding all of this together. And I kind of had, um, in terms of kind of organizing some thoughts, sort of four interestingly paralleled scenes that I thought we could talk about. Shall we start with uh, Jon Snow and the Wild Wing Camp? That sounds great. Okay, so I mean, I I see this as interestingly paired with Danis' uh, arrival in Astapor, in that they're kind of they're all these two characters are always at different extremes, right? One's ice, one's fire, one's all the way up in the north, one's all the way over in the east, and here we have them both entering through uh, significant doorways. Did you notice the 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 framing of? You know, Mance Raider's tent frame, and then that big imposing doorway that Danny goes through. I did, and I also kind of noticed that it's a Mance Raider's tent frame looks an awful lot like the one in season one that uh, when uh, uh, Mira attacks Danny in the tent. It's a very similar setup, but uh, yeah. no, 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 keep going. So, I mean, the interesting thing is, you know, in both cases, they're going to see a man who controls an army. And in both cases, the place that they're going to and what they experience there tells you a lot about the culture that they're dealing with. That, you know, Mance's camp, when, you know, John's walking through it, it's very disorganized. There's people all over the place. Tents are kind of popped up wherever they want to be. They're being constructed on the go. And it's kind of organic, right? There's lots of bones and hides and human life. And it's very, I mean, it speaks to the kind of the wildling culture, that it's all about complete freedom, that everyone's doing their own thing. But it's kind of the, the sharp-edged freedom that Rand Paul would hate, like, five minutes after he got there, because there are no property rights. There's no law except strength. You know, there's that exchange between Jon Snow and, um, and Ygritte, where he says, well, am I free to go? She says, sure, I'm free to kill you. Um... And then we see the absolute opposite of that in Astapor, where you have this inhuman order and rigidity where people have been literally dehumanized in service to a slave society. Uh, And I thought that parallel was quite interesting. No, it it really was. There were a couple of interesting things. One, just visually looking at the the lines of the Unsullied. and how they were supposed to represent this this perfect order, you know, here we'll come, we'll cut off your nipple, you'll you'll be fine, and just stand there and take it. But what was interesting is that if you actually look at those scenes, a lot of them are wobbling. I know yeah, some of the extras before. couldn't quite hit the mark. But I think it works better that way that that they are aiming for perfection and failing 
to actually okay. achieve it. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, versus uh, the Wildman camp, which isn't really aiming at anything and just doing a damn fine job of it. Uh, <laughs> and the one, I, I guess structurally, I, I hadn't thought about the the fact that these are, you know, in both cases we have Danny and John supplicating in front of a man with an army. Uh, I guess the difference would be structurally in terms of, of their relative power. Um, John has none. And Danny, yeah. you know, and I'm not sure, in the show, was she supposed to not know High and Low Valerian? I mean, was she... Um, I, I saw both her and Jorah Mormont reacting yeah. okay. and very subtly choosing not to react, that they both speak the language, and that there's this yeah. interesting translation game going where, you know, there's what they're supposed to be understanding, there's what's actually being said, and there's what they're perceiving. And, and the just didn't play for laughs the way they did in the book. Um, a little bit. A lot of people laughed at the... Um, I, I watched it with a group of friends at the line about, you know, this is an old man who stinks of piss. Um, and, you know, should I should I translate that? Of course not! <laughs> um, and yeah. the difference between Danny and John is kind of cultural power. Danny speaks the lingo. She know in many different ways. She knows what slavery is. She knows what old, you know Valyrian is. John doesn't understand the culture of the wildlings yet. That's why he kind of makes a fool of himself by kneeling in a place which is defined by their refusal to kneel to anyone. But you know he's eventually going to learn. Yeah. Also, he kneeled in the, <clears throat> knelt in the middle of a circle. Me and my stupid circle infatuation. <laughs> there are more of them. But um, yeah, I, th I think. I mean, obviously, the other big difference that, you know, Bear's mentioning is, of course, dragons. Uh, John doesn't have any. He doesn't, he doesn't even have a dire wolf at this point. Yeah, John, um, yeah, Ghost is off helping the Night's Watch, which yeah, is a the, yeah. change I didn't quite get. I, I mean, I guess it was necessary, uh, but also sort of creates the, the bond between Sam and John. It makes that a little bit stronger if Ghost is, is, is out in lieu of protecting John is protecting Sam, that makes that relationship all the more, yeah. like, if even my dog has come, right? Um, but yeah, the the scene of him supplicating before Mance Rider, that was, uh, well, f first the not Mance Rider, and then, right? Yeah. Um, I thought it was, it was, you know, sort of strange that, I guess how quickly he did it. In, in, in other words, and, and not even comparing it to how quickly he did it in the novel, just in terms of the amount of screen time and how much we've we've seen John becoming you know more and more independent to see him just following orders. I mean, because he was told, you know, go in, be a spy. And he's like, all yeah. right, if I'm going to be a spy. What do I need to do? All right, take me to your leader and I'll bow before him. And it's almost like, why would you trust this guy? I mean... Yeah, I thought they kind of nicely pulled that back, though, in the speech with Mance Raider, where once he's in front of the actual guy and who is saying directly to him, give me a reason that I'm going to buy as to whether you should come here or not, yeah. he gets in his face a little bit. He says, well, if I'm a traitor, you're a traitor. He was your brother, he was my brother, and I killed him. And ultimately, you know, when Mance sees right through his initial story about liberty, he says... I want to be on the side that fights for the living, which is a change from the book. Yeah. And, but it's one that I thought worked in that it kind of ground... It, it's a more like consistent through line from season two that John sees something that he's not supposed to, and this changes his, his understanding of what's beyond the North and the Night's Watch itself in ways that are going to carry forward. And, and the other thing is, I, I think in a way that the books didn't do, the idea of, of, of not just the White Walkers, but their, their hordes of, of reanimated dead, it's actually a lot more frightening in the series than, than it ever was in the book. In the book, it, it, not enough people take the, the, you know, the threat seriously. Oh, it's been, what, 10,000 years? You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, that's like, what, twice biblical history? I mean, who gives a fuck? Uh, but... Uh, in the series, it makes it quite clear, and I, I think using Sam as a proxy for the audience is, is a really good idea. Having him be the one to end season two by staring down a White Walker, and then to open with with him running through the mountains. Yeah, you know, which barely. I thought was like an, had a nice horror movie aesthetic to it, in uh, the I, way I, that I, they were sort of showing and not showing, 
and then the you know the beast that grabs him and keeps going after his leg even while you know it, it had it like a fire yeah exactly Dogs on top of it <laughs> you know I mean, but just for the people who are like book readers who were really pissed off that a certain thing didn't happen it doesn't happen then in the books either there yeah. are great things for sam to come i think i think i'll i'll just say something that will no doubt be very controversial and it'd probably be the only thing that people talk about which is you know fuck book readers um <laughs> i i don't i don't care if you've just read the books uh or or just watched the series you know each is it, it's in it's in its own medium it has to work as it is some right. things that work in novels don't work in film i mean i don't know if you've ever seen either of the the versions of ulysses that have been filmed but they're both terrible no i haven't they're awful and they're, yeah, uh, they don't sound like very filmable sources. No, and it, I mean that's sort of an extreme example, but it 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 it's the same logic, which is things that work on film don't work in in literature and vice versa. And and so people who who really want it, I mean, I always sort of wonder what motivates that. Why why are you so invested in the way it was that you can't actually appreciate? You know the, the way that it's being represented here. At least be able to acknowledge that the different media, different expectations, and because otherwise, I mean, granted, many many internet comments are born of tiny differences between yeah. series and and their works uh, or the works they're based on. But I mean, honestly, like I, I'm very happy that Joss Whedon didn't remain true to the spirit of the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, thank God he, he, he saw the mistakes that were made and, and updated. <laughs> but yeah. uh, this is not I mean, going to go over well. I think there's, there's differences of two scales. One is, you know, and I think you look at the way that people responded to Tywin and Arya's storyline last season, and which was loved complete it. fabrication, but yeah. adored. Versus how they felt about, say, the changes to like Robin and Catelyn's storyline, where what's been changed materially affects their characters and their motivations and you know implications for their actions. So I think you know the key thing for me is don't be kind of relentlessly on one side or the other, but kind of see where adaptation serves a useful purpose and where. Yeah, to find a happy medium and exactly. And, and you have to, another way of looking at it is that you have to respect each audience that you have. George R. R. Martin has to respect the audience of the people who've written the books, uh, but when he's writing episodes, he has to respect the audience who have only seen the HBO version. And, I mean, he could remain, you know, forever faithful, but I, I, from his point of view, that's got to be sort of boring. I mean... <laughs> if I created these characters over a decade ago and they were going around doing the same damn things that they, they've been doing for 10 I might want to actually say, you know, uh, 10 years ago I had this idea and I think I have a better one now. Fans can yeah, but Brian Kirkman's doing a similar thing on Walking Dead where he was like, you know what, when we did that, it didn't really work. It had these negative consequences down the road. Um, Rick, shut the fuck up. Better. Shut yeah. up, Rick. Rick, Rick, and, shut up! <laughs> is this is this a point where I can talk about my theory about uh, Talisa McGear or not? Or would uh, that yeah. be a spoiler? No, that, okay. uh, that's fine. Sure. So there's a theory going around uh, based on a YouTube clip from the that you can see. Yeah. I posted it into the, the comments last week that Talisa is a spy for the Lannisters. Um, and that explains why the character isn't the character from the book. And this is very equally divided, the, the, the viewership, about whether this is a good or day or not. But I'm really hoping it pans out because it at least says there was a deviation from the source material that was done with a purpose in mind. It yeah. wasn't done just because they thought Asha and Osha sounded too similar. <laughs> it, it was done because they said... We've got characters and things that have to happen. We've got a different medium to work with. Let's kind of get to the same end with a different path. And I quite like that. Um, speaking of working, what did you think about the, the giant on the one hand and then the deadly manticore on the other in terms of a use of CGI in, in the world? I, I thought the giant was... I, I thought the giant worked. He, he was uh, a, a little too uh, 
formally attired, but um Yeah, I kinda of missed the Yeti. Yeah, I, I just I mean this is gonna be something that, that that a lot of viewers are gonna have to deal with. I mean, with Melisandre as well, as the series goes on, we're gonna have a lot more pure fantasy elements. Whereas we've had kind of an almost Shakespearean um, battle for battle of wits for the throne up to this point, or battle with battles. Um, you know, we're going to start to see a lot more of these fantastic elements, and I, I, I like that they're breaking them in slowly. Like the giant is no big deal. He he yeah, comes yeah. into the screen, he's, and he looks like he fits there. Exactly. Rob looks at him, and he's like, "Oh, you you are very big." <laughs> And I like the detail of the pounding the, the stick into the ground. It made it have a really physical presence. Yeah, especially if you had your subwoofer on. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it was great. I I, I, I thought that worked. Um, I, in part because I, I well, I thought, uh, I'll be kind and say, I really thought that worked. Yeah. And what about the, the other part of your question. What about the manticore? I mean... Yeah, that's I thought I answer. <laughs> it just it didn't look as real, and I thought the there was something weird about the physical movement of Barristan going in and stabbing it that didn't quite click. I think I think the problem with a lot of CGI is simply that it can all be solved if there's weather. Um, the the so mm -hmm. for for example, if you if you film something in CGI and you add snow after the fact, it creates a nice little fuzzy, blurry thing, but everything is fuzzy and blurry, not just the CGI. I mean, this is what was so terrible uh, about watching The Hobbit in, you know, 48 frames per second, is that it was very, very obvious. Uh, <laughs> everything looked like sets. Yeah, every, well, one, everything looked like sets, and, and you know, uh, two... You know, Frodo was was he was talking to this thing that looked more real than he did, and mm. which of course means it looked totally fake. It didn't look real at all. It just it it, it was so sharp. Uh, yeah, the Manticore had that sharpness. Yeah, I I I, I just don't like that, and I don't even remember the Manticore uh, actually. But uh, I've only watched the episode a, twice now, so it was that that little bug thing that comes out of the bowl. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, no, that looked terrible. <laughs> yeah, but that I was say, awful. the little girl with the freaky blue teeth, that, that was scary. I, no, I was fine with that. That was, you know, a nice sort of connection to the, the House of the Undying, although I thought she was not supposed to be part of that. I thought she was supposed to be that other group of assassins. But... Yeah, the sorrowful men who say, I'm so sorry when they kill you. Yeah. I think they cut that out just because, you know... Too many one... clans of assassins at this point. Yeah, it's one secret society too many. Um... It's sort of conservation of ninjutsu, um, or I, we we could just call it anti-aliasing to to kind of stick with the <laughs> sharpness. Of it, you know, it's it's yeah. anti-aliasing when you decide that there is such a thing as one conspiracy too far, and just kind of rein it in. Um, oh, I shouldn't coin things this late in the day, but um, but yeah, the, I, I I thought that was okay. Uh, the, the giant actually liked. Um, but also the way that the giant was shot, and I, I don't want to pull it up on my computer right now. But if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, it was a nice low angle shot. Um, so you know, it was a kind of nice pan to the right from a low angle, emphasize the size without making it look unrealistic, and then we cut to a shot of John looking at what we had yeah. just seen, um, which is a nice you know it encompasses our reaction to the same thing, and we're having the same feeling that he's having, which is, do we actually want to believe what we're seeing? And yeah. if you can create that 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 sort of mimicry of what the character's feeling with what what you're doing, it feels more organic, even though obviously it's more contrived. Um, but anyway, keep going. You okay. have other questions. I keep seeing yeah. my own reflection, my glasses, sure. myself out. So. Um, I can take my own off as well. Uh, so the kind of other. We're all blind. Th okay. Yeah, on. we're all completely blind. So the other thing that I thought I, I wanted to discuss from the Astapor section. Is this debate between Danny and Jora about how do you, how are they going to deal with slavery? And I thought it was very interesting that Jora is basically acting like a Virginia planter in like the 1780s about you know how much better it is to be a kind slave master, given that he is 
at the end of the day, someone who is exiled for slaving. Whereas Danny, someone who was, in one reading, a slave herself. You know, she was sold. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, sold into sexual yeah, slavery sl- to someone she couldn't possibly consent to. Um, My only and, problem with that whole scene is that Danny is already, she already is a slave owner. She already owns slaves. Well, I mean, she set them free at the end of the first season. Yeah, but there, yeah, there's still that like white hair, you know, white savior issue, yeah. but. I did think it was interesting this, like this it's kind a of situation for. Her. Yeah. Like, oh my god, what am I gonna do with slaves? But it's it's I think it's slightly different in that now she's she's given the choice about whether she's going to engage in mass scale with a slave society. You know, that previously her plan was the Dothraki, right? This this group of free warriors from a different culture who would decide to follow her. And, you know, she still has some of them um, versus, like, this force of 8,000 men that are going to be viewed, and there was a very subtle allusion to this, about how these men will be viewed in Westeros. You know, we can see from Varys, Westerosi do not, like, trust or, or esteem eunuchs, and they're not that keen on people from Essos either. So well, on the one hand, I mean, you, you, you can't trust... It. From the perspective of someone like Cersei, you can't trust someone you can't manipulate. And if you're using sexual wiles as your main source of power, eunuchs obviously are going to get in your way. Um, uh, same thing with, with you know the camp prostitutes that uh, are discussed more in the books than in the, in the series. But you, what's used to mollify the troops? I mean, none of that, the traditional logic works. And I just, I don't know, I... I just don't buy Danny's. Um, she's had slaves before. She just locked her s- former sex slave in a vault and left. Yeah, I did. Like, that was one of those changes I I kind of didn't like. I mean, she's obviously thought about the issues. So, sure. And, but you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how she comes down on this decision. Um, in the same way that you know. John's faced with a decision about which side he's on. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's the thing. As much as we like her, she's not. John is, at least has noble motivations. He's trying to protect people. He he wants he wants the wall to hold. He wants you know the North to survive. Danny, Danny wants the kingdom that is her birthright back. We should not like that. We're Americans. We should not be very happy when people are like, no, it's in my blood. I'm supposed yeah. to rule here. Except that Americans are goofy about princesses. That's like well, my long-standing beef dynasty. with the Disney, with the Disney Chinese, princess thing. Clinton's oh yeah, sure. Is. I mean, we're we're goofy about that anyway, but we shouldn't like it. Yeah, I mean, you know, we should be for the the wildling way of doing things. And one of the things that I think is kind of interesting in the books that doesn't quite make it into the show is that democracy is presented as this weird barbarian custom. Much in the same way that I don't know the you know Persians would have looked at you know a, Athenian you know, democracy. Athenian. Uh, I mean, we, that, we have a direct democracy in the Iron. What, we should, should we talk about it? We probably shouldn't talk well, about it. Well, there's there's a couple things. So the the mountain men that Tyrion meets, yeah. like when he's among them, he says at one point, like he's thinking to himself, they allow everyone to sit in their councils of war, and even women get to speak. God, these people are backwards. And, you know, the, the Mance Raider, you know, he's this kind of fearsome example of, like, what happens when you let just anyone be king. They, you know, create this giant army. But let's talk about the king, uh, the Iron Islands, because there's an interesting um, kind of quasi-tradition, which is that they have this tradition of the king's moot. Right, but they haven't followed it for hundreds of years. All right, everybody. Spoiler alert. Um, we're we're jumping way ahead. We're, in, we're jumping like half book ahead now, aren't we? Yeah, a little bit. All right, people, you've been warned. <laughs> Go on. So you know, traditionally, the way it works is that any captain can you know stand in the king's moot and say, "I want to be king," 
and if enough people shot for them, they get to be king. But Balon would, never went through that. None of the Ironborn lords have gone through that for hundreds of years, and it's always been this contested thing that, you know, they've got one tradition that says anyone can do this, and they've got another tradition that says if I have more men with axes, <laughs> I'm the king. Um, but there's there's another democracy that people often forget about. That's the Night's Watch. The Lord Commander is elected by all the men of the Night's Watch. And even though, I mean, this was actually the first essay, essay I ever wrote on Race for the Iron Throne was about the prologue and what it tells us about the, the way that the Night's Watch has become corrupted by essentially class society. That oh, there, are, there are noblemen and there are peasants. And that, you know, there's a reason that Jon Snow is being groomed for rank and not someone like Gran or Pip. But they still have this ideal of election and, you know, uh, a sense of brotherhood and equality. Well, election and preterition, I mean, they, they, which obviously go hand in hand, but, you know, we, we actually do have John trying to lift up some of the preterite, you know, Sam and such. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I actually hadn't, I hadn't thought about that because it was a few books ahead, but the, the elections in the Night's Watch versus, you know, what we get with, um, with, with Garrett and, uh, uh, what's that asshole's name? Uh, Sir Waymar Royce. Yes, Royce. Royce with his fancy clothes and his... Yes, who know. happens to come from the Veil, vale, which is the most, like, class-stratified part of the Seven Kingdoms, arguably. Yeah, and he makes fun of people, you know, oh, yeah. You suckled at your mother's breast. Yeah. Your mom, I had a wet nurse. Uh, really, that's that's your... Yeah, my, my students hate him. Um, and will again. He's, he's, he's an interesting character, though, because as contemptible he is... I mean, he, he, he's occupying the space of, like, the asshole West Point cadet lieutenant who always gets shot in, in Vietnam movies, like, you know, five minutes into the film. But at the same time, in the books anyway... He's the one guy of the three of them who, when the Night's Watch is faced with the enemy that it was designed to fight, stands his ground and, like, goes down fighting. The other two, like, one hides and one runs away. Well, uh, so there is that, like, interesting... Part. I mean, yeah. that, that is their job, to run away. I mean, because, you know, a scout's no good if they're dead. And, you know, the yeah, only I thing know, you know is... Th th then they're just like Benjamin, and you're like, all right, well... Well, yeah, yeah. He, he, we haven't seen you in a while. Who knows what the hell's going on there? So, um, speaking of of wet nurses and and noble families, I want to sort of talk about these two scenes of of Lannisters and their family issues: uh, Tyrion and Cersei, and then Tyrion and Tywin. Um, it's just very interesting. I mean, I I picked up on the whole like starting the scene, uh, looking through the gates. That was very interesting. And, you know, speaking of your circles, did you notice how uh, Cersei and Tyrion are constantly circling each other in that scene and maintaining this distance between them? I, I, I did, because at this point I am physically incapable of not noticing circles in Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's just, it, 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 it has become a hermeneutic for me such that I, I, can't, just, I can't get away from it. But, it, you know, it's a, I, I, I thought those scenes were, both of them were, were, Really well done, especially the the Tywin and, and Tyrion. Um, in part because Tyrion is the only sympathetic Lannister, and yes, this was, right. Well, yeah, and and this was the the all right, everyone pile on Tyrion episode. Yeah, like, he's down. Should we help? No, let's kick the little fucker. Right. I mean, it was. Yeah. It's, it's, it's although it's interesting. Like even at his worst, he knows how to deal with Cersei. He's able to put her on the back foot, you know, even though, you know, he starts off that scene basically believing he's about to be murdered. Um, that, you know, here's his sister who's just ordered his death with two of the King's Guard who she sent last time, and, you know, he could die right now. And it takes him about five seconds to realize, oh, she's afraid of me. I have something over her. And it's interesting, there's like a third figure in the room, which is the image of father. Right? It's their daddy issues, like, invisibly manifest. Um, and how much of that ties into this question of, of truth and slander? Um, because I saw that very much carrying into the scene with, with Tyrion and Tywin. 
um, in that, again, it's it's two people maintaining a constant distance, although it's more fixed, uh, as it should be, because, you know, Tywin's the, the one with all the power, and Tyrion doesn't have anything he really wants. Um, but there's also a third figure in the room, which is Tyrion's mother, Tywin's dead wife. Who? He's, you know, careful to remind him you killed. Like, you, little boy. Yeah, and, you know, and the kind of, the, the, you can sort of, someone, I, I on a, a podcast I listened to, I don't remember which one, sort of described Tywin as uh, Lannister kryptonite. That this family of incredibly snarky, scheming, uh, cynical people who keep a distance between themselves and the world, the moment they get near Tywin, all of those defenses fade fade away. Like, you saw that when he's with Jamie in season one, where, like, Jamie oh, is yeah. this strutting alpha male figure, and then within a second, he's, like, reduced to a stuttering child. Well, it's because his dad had his hands in a stag. I mean, it, it's sort of hard to maintain the, yeah. the, the, the aura of manliness when the other guy in the room is literally disemboweled in something. You will feel less manly. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, it is I interesting that he's the best upon. swordsman in the, in the country. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, was just saying, I don't think Tyrion actually loses the battle of wits with his father, and I think that's what, what's interesting. And, and, you know, I sort of wrote about how hmm. I, I increasingly think that the way that they're going in terms of how they're setting up the show visually is that um, it's all Tywin. And, you know, Cersei thinks she's manipulating things, but she's doing it at Tywin's behest. Tyrion thinks he's doing things at its behest. Jamie, we don't even know where the fuck he is, but he's still somehow acting, <laughs> you know, on, on Tywin's behalf. And I, I just, I see them all in, in, in a way that I, that makes them actually more sympathetic, especially Cersei, as, as pawns in their father's game. Uh, up until the obvious point, which we won't mention anything yeah. about, because that I mean, would be too spoilers. I, I see it slightly differently, and to, to build off your post on service, you know, Tywin has this very interesting conception of the family as a unit above the individual, that you are in service to the house Lannister, which even Tywin himself is in service to. It's all about legacy. It's all about Absolutely. what will happen a hundred years after they're dead. Um, and that, you know, so much of of what's going on is about the image of, of House Lannister, that Cersei can't allow her her image to be tainted, because otherwise she's in danger of becoming the disappointing child. And then what's going on, in part between Ty uh, Tywin and Tyrion, is a battle over different images and different truths. That, that Tyrion says, I defended the city. I bled for my family, and by law, I am the heir to Casterly Rock. And the subtext is, I am your son. Treat me like your son. Yeah. Please. Please treat me like your son. And then Tywin responds with a completely different truth. You brought a whore into my bed, I saved the city, and you are the closest thing to no son of mine that the law will allow. And I thought that was very interesting how this family is so much about the manipulation of different truths. And, and you are right, and I, I, hadn't thought about, I hadn't thought about it like that, but you, you are right that, that the one point on which Tyrion loses is that argument, which I, I, you know, I say it does the Battle of Blackwater, therefore I should, you know, be in charge of Casterly Rock. That actually makes no sense. One thing has nothing to do with the other. Um, sure. And, and he creates, Tyrion in his mind creates a causal connection that doesn't actually uh, exist. And, you know, Tywin is quick. Yeah, well, I mean, it goes back to their, it goes back to their, their past, which is, you know, Jamie was supposed to be the heir. He was supposed to be the new Tywin, right? But he never stepped into his father's shoes because he joins the Kingsguard, right? Tyrion didn't know what to expect on his, when he grew of age. And what does he get? He doesn't get Casterly Rock. He doesn't get... He gets the um, sewers of Casterly Rock. He gets, he gets the sewers. He gets literally to, to handle the shit. Um, and he does it brilliantly. Um, 
and he's here's another. To it's been recapitulated. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> nice, but like, and it's recapitulated later, right? Before Jamie's captured, Tywin is leaning on him to lead the war effort. Jamie is taken out of the picture, so Tywin leaves Tyrion to deal with the shit in King's Landing. And the moment he's done, he loses any semblance of, you know, of respect that he used to have. Um, and I, I did think it was supremely ironic for a man who we just saw the previous episode, right, literally riding into the king's uh, throne room on a gleaming white stallion to get That's this giant the metal pinned on him. Yeah, you know, shitting on the floor... But he says, oh, I don't demand anything when I win. When he's just, like, gotten this massive, you know, heaping of power once again. The thing that has defined his entire adult life is that he's been the hand of the king for the longest in recorded history, except for one guy. That's who and, he is. He's time when the hand. And, but the thing is, is now he's, he, he's only the hand in name. He is the king. And I think it's something that... We get almost oh, yeah. feel a little bad for Joffrey, and uh, that that which is an amazing <laughs> bit of you know sympathy building. We almost feel bad for Joffrey that when he realizes that you know first his his grandfather and then his newly betrothed are both exercising a kind of power that that he simply can't. Yeah, right? that he's a coward. Well, I I. Th I don't. I, I think he realized that, but I. I mean, I have weird issues, yeah. and and I haven't really looked, looked back at it the way I should. But I have strange issues about the timing of Joffrey running, and whether or not he saw the Hound in the Blackwater episode. I think he ran before the Hound did. No, but, um, no, because the 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 Hound like Tyrion tells him like you've got to go back out there, and he says like straight to Joffrey. He says, "Fuck the king." Fuck well, the yeah. king's guard. Fuck the city. And, and then, he's looking straight at uh, Joffrey. He says, "Fuck the king. Yeah. I'm out of here." And that's and that's, that's when Joffrey, when Joffrey gets the summons. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that that's that's what I'm saying. Like, if Joffrey sees that it's okay to run, that it it might if the hound is doing it, you know, maybe I can do that too. Um, but that that's probably another issue. I I, I guess I would say that I meant it, more physical cowardice, that he shrinks back from contact with the world, and when you see him doing vile things to people, it's always through intermediaries, right? He uses the Kingsguard to beat Sansa. He uh, puts a crossbow onto a whore to make her beat another whore, you know, to death or we don't, we don't know. And this is really making me very, very interested for when we finally meet Ramsay Bolton. And I'm so curious as to like how how the audience is going to react to this very different figure. But what I meant by like cowardice compared to Marjorie is that like he's hiding in this box from his own people, and she effortlessly kind of makes herself this lady die figure, you know, and just like charms the pants off everyone. Yeah, um, instant sympathy amongst the children. She's very good at it. Um, very sort of touching if you didn't realize it was all an act. Um, I mean, it, you'd think, well, she might be able to reform Joffrey, although I think it's been made pretty plain. He's beyond that. But no, I, I do like that, that image that I, that I brought up in that, or that the second to last image, uh, no, the last image in the post of, uh, of Joffrey actually cowering and and the directors actually love this pose for cowering yeah and I, I wrote about it earlier uh in one of my posts about circles in game of thrones um when uh when cat and Tyrion are uh surrounded uh and and you know right his hands are tied and he's tucked like this yeah he's tucked like this and she has a knife and then you had just this this past episode, you have Joffrey in the back of his, you know, little car processional carriage, like this is his uh palanquin. Yeah. He's literally being carried around like you know, baggage. 
and I, I, I got to say, I, I love some of those the, those stills I took where where he seems to be spying on his own people yes. while everyone is looking at him. <laughs> almost, almost like they're they're a, like a foreign species to him. Yeah, that he's like looking at them through the bars in a zoo, and you don't know which is on which side of the bars. Well, no, it, it, exactly. He thinks that he's the he's the one at the zoo, and everyone else is looking at him as if he's the animal. And yeah. Um, and speaking of the posture, did you notice he does the same posture at dinner? Like when his mother is, or not the same posture, but a very similar posture that when, when his mother is saying, oh yes, when we went to Flea Bottom, the king almost died. He sort of shrinks, shrinks down in the yeah. chair. And I, I just, I love that scene at dinner where, you know, you can sort of see that Marjorie is playing with Cersei you know, almost in a doubles match with Loras, but Cersei doesn't have a partner because Joffrey is like the only thing he's thinking about is how can I look like a real man? Right? I've just been like verbally emasculated by my mother. Which, honestly, you think he would be used to at this point, but um, <laughs> apparently not. So, uh, was there anything else you wanted to uh, cover? I'm. I'm I'm looking at the time gone by, and actually, I don't see it. So, uh, uh, we started at uh, six twenty, I believe. Okay, so we're at so forty minutes. Um, which maybe is, which talk is about fine. coming up for next week. I I don't know what's coming up for next week. I I have I have hopes, but the same hopes for the entire season. Um, yeah, I mean the things that we're ex explicitly going to see for next week. Yeah, my DVR uh, always cuts off like... Ah, well, I, I did get to see those. So, Arya meets the Brotherhood Without Banners. Oh, Arya, yes. I would like to see her <laughs> Yes. in the uh, in next week's episode. Um, we get... Uh, what else? What else? Um, Arya meets the Band Without Brothers. Um, hold on. Let me look this up. Just because I I knew this a minute ago. It's okay. Uh, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll just say that I'm going to edit this all out, but then when I try to, it's going to be such a pain in the ass. I'm going to leave it all in. Um, but gotcha. we can at least pretend, you know, keep up the shred that this this will all be edited out. <laughs> we can't hear right. you typing. All right. I'm just pulling up uh, Winter is Coming, which, by the way, if people are following the show, winteriscoming.net is a really good resource for anything about the show. But... Um, you know, I, I that's my favorite storyline out of this book. Oh, are you? It's, Absolutely. Uh, you you um, said you were surprised when I, I... I thought you said you were surprised that, like, my students, for, for them, it's all Arya and Jon Snow. That, that's it was the, more than Jon Snow. Because oh, yeah, they, absolutely. I've, always, I've always preferred Tyrion to Jon Snow, uh, in part because Jon has always struck me as more the conventional fantasy uh, protagonist, and Tyrion's so unusual. Yeah, I think it's also that we're both writers, and I, I think we appreciate the written word a little more than the average. I, I think most people, well, to put it this way, while you look that up, um, uh, I start, when I teach Game of Thrones, I start by teaching uh, Fellowship of the Ring. And uh, so they get to know Sean Bean as Boromir. Yeah, and his many deaths. The majority of the class doesn't make the connection. They don't realize that Ned Stark is played by the same guy as Boromir. They fall in love with Boromir, right? They, his betrayal mm. and, then, and his redemption, mm. and they absolutely love Okay, so they really identify with the kid. With the guy. They, mm. they love him, and then they completely forget he fucking exists. And, and when we get to Game of Thrones, <laughs> halfway through the quarter, someone's like, you know, Ned Stark looks familiar. And I just was like, yeah, Boromir. And half the class, their, their eyes just... And... These light bulbs are going off everywhere. And you sort of wonder, how did he not notice that? And in part, it's because he was playing the traditional heroic figure in, in Lord of the Rings, the redemptive character. Yeah. Whereas in Game of Thrones, he's a much more complex, slightly older. Not re He doesn't look really that much older. I hope to look that, that good when I am that much older than I was in 2001. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think Snow fits in the same... Kind of pattern as Boromir. They, they like this, this, this the the down and out character who comes back and makes something of himself. And uh, hmm. uh, and Tyrion, I think they think is he's funny, but um, 
in all honesty, I've, I've had lots of conversations in class where uh, I've had to kind of steer them one way or another and say, actually, you're laughing the wrong way. And I, I, think I, I think I mentioned this at one point, either on Facebook or on the blog, that one of my students came up with an idea for something called Reverse Game of Thrones, where um, oh, yes. Tyrion would be played by a normal that was weird. person, and everyone else would be a little person. And uh, we had to have a conversation about, there are there there is a right way to laugh with an at Tyrion, because he does play the jester when it suits yeah. him, and he is actually quite funny. And There's going to be some really uncomfortable moments later in season three and then in season four, where I'm I'm very curious about how they're going to handle the specific issue of Tyrion as the butt of laughter and as yeah. the. We're never going to get that far. We barely get through season one as is, except for the few enterprising students. The quarter system. Uh, I ten weeks. Uh, oh, so so they were mostly focusing on Jon Snow in season one, because I was going to say, yeah. one of like the things I thought worked the least well in season two was Jon Snow's storyline. Yeah, they, just, they don't see that for the most part. He just screwed up from like day one. So, okay, here's what's uh, on for next week. It's it's Arya with a Brotherhood Without Banners. All right. It's Jamie and Cersei have their face off. And it's uh, Sansa meeting the Queen of Thorns. Um, yeah, the less Sansa, the better. Uh, I, I, I've read online where people say her character is being redeemed by by the series. No. No. I just, I don't see it. I don't know. Maybe you disagree. I, 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 I do in the sense that, you know, it wasn't until I started doing Race for the Iron Throne that I really got inside Arya's head. And I, like, when you when you go back to her chapters, you know, for four or five times, and you realize Sansa is someone raised on fantasy literature. And she expects the world to work like fantasy literature. And that well, she's raised, I mean, in many she's, ways... She... In, 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 in the fiction of the show, it's not fantasy literature. She's, she is an ideological creature. I mean, pure and simple. She... She yeah, has yeah. bought everything in, in the old Marxist sense of ideology. Any which one you yeah. want to choose. Um, but Sure. And now she's doing something else. In that she's trying to, to figure a way through the world as if she's learning it for the first time. And that's why I did like the scene with her and Littlefinger where you know, she's desperately trying to get out of an untenable situation. But she's starting to get a little bit better at it. Where you saw her thing about you know, when, when Littlefinger says, well, how can I trust you? Well, and she parrots straight back at him, well, that's because you know I'm the worst liar in this town. You know, throwing his own words back in his face, which is a signature King's Landing move. You know, and um, I have to say, you know, the um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that as much for the Queen of Thorns as I am for Sansa, because the Queen of Thorns is a fascinating character for the series, and I hope that lots of people write about her. Because um, no she's very different. All right, okay, I see. Well, I mean, not just you, but you know, there's been so much debate about Game of Thrones and gender. Um, that you know, Olena is a character that we really haven't seen on the show before. But she's going to essentially be. I mean, and, and in the novel, she's sort of almost treated like a, almost the the female equivalent of Tyrion. Someone whose social status has placed them in a position where they can say anything they want to and be taken seriously or not, but they still have the freedom to, you know, speak their mind. Yeah, and well, that's certainly how she appears. How she is is a di And that's what I like about her is she's very multifaceted. She looks like this frail old grandmother that no one really listens to anymore. But what she does behind the scenes is very different. And... It's kind of like, I, I think one way of, of thinking about her is she's like a combination of Cersei and Tyrion. That she is playing the female in a world of politics, but she's doing it from a place of kind of satire and, uh, and you know, sympathetic humor. Oh, man, you just, like, you just made, uh, you know, the, the image of Cersei and Tyrion. Uh. <laughs> Stupid fucking show makes that a little too literal. Anyway, go on, go on. Um, whereas, you know, I think Lena Headey has done some really interesting things with Cersei's character, but 
you know, and her drunk scene in episode nine is a good example. Oh, absolutely. No, that was because normally she's not allowed to be funny. Yeah. She's got to be evil. Whereas Elena is funny. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, Lena Headley, uh, still in my mind, um, is Sarah Connor, and I. It's not going to ever, I think, go away. And so, in part, there are weird moments where I feel that that her vindictive plotting is completely justified because <laughs> the only Joffrey can stop Skynet from... <laughs> um, but I just... I, I, I actually... I, and I, I, I do think I read about this. A, a class where I, I desperately tried to make Circe a sympathetic character. And uh, I argued with my class for about an hour and a half. And then I had a, another class right after it. After, And I again, unsuccessfully argue for an hour and a half, and then, because of Mascus, I did the same thing in the next class, right. trying to get them to, to, to understand the position Cersei's in. She has no power. She, like, the, like Danny, was sort of sold into um, slavery, essentially. Uh, you know, her her new husband whispers another woman's name on their, you know, their wedding night, and, and it's sort of all downhill from there. She does what she can. You know, she's had a terrible life, and and also, you know, it, it's weird the way that, that incest is always made light of on the show, but I, I don't necessarily... I, I, they never really specify who the original instigator of the, the Jamie Searcy affair was. Yeah. I mean, if, if I recall correctly, I don't know if this is spoiling, but it was pretty mutual in that it was, it's always been shown as this kind of almost like a fascination with a mirror that they were so... So, they're so identical. Yeah. yeah, they're they're so identical, and they were. I think they started at a time really before they started being differentiated by gender. That the, you know there was a time when Cersei could dress up like Jamie and see what it was like to run around the world as a boy. And they went to the Latini and Mirror stage together. Um, I yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't want to go there. But um, I I can see that. I just. You know that that's a nice thing to write, but in, in terms of like character building, I've never actually known a, a relationship that was uh, that co-equal. And I, I think it's a power differential that matters, especially in light of things that happen later with Jamie coming back around and oh yeah, wants who to. But we we'll we'll table that discussion. We have sure we have ten episodes to to spoil the entire rest of the series, <laughs> um, so we don't have to do it all this first time. Um, we should probably try to wrap it up. Uh, I didn't okay. talk much uh, about the visuals uh, in in part because I, I think you were right. I, I I think I did ruin it by writing about it before, but I would just feel totally yeah, unprepared. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm just one of those people. I I you should see my lesson plans. I never use. Um, well, no, you do because I put them on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, but, you know, I've I've walked into sections without lesson plans. So. Yeah, I've done that. It's always ended horribly. I I end up just. Claimed me the class that I have a sinus infection, took too much Sudafed, and that's why I can't string two thoughts together. So I, I, I totally overprepare. But um, uh, also, it's just honestly for me, writing that today was a really, really difficult. It, it felt a lot like my qualifying exams. It just like felt too soon. <laughs> like I haven't absorbed all the information yet, and I'm trying to make sense of it. I'm glad though it, it made so enough sense to you that you brought it up. Um, because it really seems like the Lannisters are being imprisoned, uh, visually. Yeah. Um, I don't know if my explanation makes any sense, but I definitely have evidence that, that that's going on at least. Yeah, uh, sure. No, I saw the I saw the, the the bars at work. I mean, the the I'm not so sure about the 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 bit with Danny because you know there is that one shot of the the downward hanging canopy. But then it pans to this amazing vista of Astapor. Oh well, no, no, that uh, just helped. That, that, that helps yeah. make my argument. Because the oh, so, so that she's play. she's coming out of the cage. Is that the idea? Yeah, no, no. That that's ex exactly. I like that. that I is like that, that by putting by juxtaposing these two shots, which I, I could have gotten really technical and actually you know scribbled my yellow lines all over them, but it you know the vanishing point is it, 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 not vanishing point, but it the the. Focal point it meets at the same exact spot on the screen. These two shots are meant to sort of mm. echo each other, and it's all about the fact that Danny, everything wide open, 
You know, there's a fucking dragon in front of her, and if he wants to leave, he can just. Oh, fly we didn't away. even talk about the dragons. Well, okay, we should and just. In terms of like see. CGI in the world. Yeah, no, I actually I thought the dragons were fine, but I'm used they, to. They they were before. amazing in in. Oh, okay. I mean, I just what what I loved about it was you had the tactile thing of where she's you know scratching that dragon like a cat. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. But also the way they were interacting with the water as like. You know, not just skimming over it, but diving into it and pulling fish out of it and frying the fish. I have, an, I have this odd feeling that they were, like, throwing seals off a boat and just kind of doing motion capture. But, um, <laughs> and also, you like, I, I, I scratch my cat's chins and they, their breath seems to resemble fire at times. But um, I, I, just, I thought the dragons were, were, were excellent. I, I mean, granted, there's not that much competition for, for making a realistic dragon because... Yeah, but bad dragons look really, really bad. Do you remember I, the movie Dragon Knight? No, I never saw. With, see, I was going back to like Sean Connery fire. as the dragon. No, I never saw that one. See um, if you can find it somewhere, because it honestly, it's it's one of those examples of the way that fantasy used to work before Lord of the Rings, so that you could do it big and succeed. I'm not the biggest fan of the dude. This is terrible taste it kind of <laughs> argument. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I thought I thought the dragons were great. They yeah. to make them charming and personable, um, which they should be, given that they're going to grow into eight ton fire breathing beasts who are the equivalent in the, that world's nuclear bomb. They should be cuddly. Um, yeah. You know, I. I I, I thought that was done really well, but I, I also like the kind of nice bond between um, the sort of, and as you said, like scratching a, a cat on its chin, there was something casual and 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 familiar about that, mm -hmm. not not practiced. And so, I, you know, I, I thought I thought that CGI worked really well, unlike the stupid little thing came out of the ball. What the fuck was that? You know. Yeah. But, uh, and you know, we'll 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 see how. Because there, there, there was a connection there that I haven't always seen with the wolves. That I mean, in part, this has to do with the fact that they're using real wolves and just cinematically making them look enormous. But the 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 casualness of connection that should be there between yeah. a Stark and his wolf just isn't there. Well, no, no, it it isn't. But I oh, uh, without getting into spoilers. I think that's in part because the Starks themselves don't yet realize the connection that they have with, with their dire wolves. Yeah. They don't they don't understand the, the full extent of it yet. Um, so I but think I think we've only seen them actually physically touching a wolf once when Rob entered Jamie's cell in, in the premiere of season two. That is very specific. Um yeah uh no no because Oh no! Wait. Technically, I think I, I, I think Bran, but he's unconscious, so that doesn't count. Well, it's standing over him, but he's he's not interacting yeah. with it in the way that you think a child would with the the wolf that saved his life. Yeah. In in his defense, he he was in a coma. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'm gonna. Okay. Cool. I, I think we I think we do need to wrap this up because uh, otherwise the file gets so big uh, it crashes my computer, um, <laughs> which which is something that will be rectified hopefully in the next sure. couple of weeks. Um, uh, but about 45, 50 minutes is as much as we can go. But this has been okay. a hell of a lot cool. of fun. It's been fun. I uh, can't wait for next week. All right, and uh, uh, we'll we'll do this again next week. So join us again for the lawyers, guns, and money. Game of Thrones podcast. How the fuck do we end up doing? All right, it's, it's what we do. Um, and uh, all right, we'll see you next week.